Whenever a rupture takes place in a blood vessel of our body, it creates a leaking of blood. Some of that blood begins to leak out of the blood vessel and into the tissue of our capillaries. Now, if this condition is not repaired, if the blood vessel is not sealed off in some way or form, too much blood can actually leak out of that blood vessel and that can lead to the opening of our capillaries and that can lead to the collection of blood, the pooling of blood in those capillaries, which eventually causes the individual to go into shock. That decreases the blood pressure of that individual and the individual can ultimately die. Now, as a result of this reasoning, we might assume that blood ruptures would be a constant life-threatening situation if it wasn't for our body's ability to actually repair and seal off the ruptures in a very effective and very efficient way by using the blood clotting cascade. And one reason why the blood clotting cascade is so effective and so efficient is because it allows a very quick way to produce a great number of blood clots that can aggregate and collect and form a mesh-like structure that keeps keeps a watertight seal across that blood vessel and that prevents the movement of blood across that rupture. So this amplification and magnification of blood clots in the blood clot cascade is achieved by using multiple different pathways. So we have the intrinsic pathway and we have the extrinsic pathway. And it's also achieved by using positive feedback loops. Now, what is a positive feedback loop? Well, in a certain pathway, in a certain reaction pathway, we have many intermediates. And what a positive feedback is, it's when one of those intermediates down that reaction pathway returns back to some initial molecule and activates it and promotes its activation so that ultimately we produce even more of the final product, in this case, even more of our blood clot. So recall that this is our blood clotting cascade. So our extrinsic pathway is shown with the black arrows. The intrinsic pathway is shown with the blue arrows. And when these two pathways converge, they form the final common pathway. And that is shown in red. Now the positive feedback loops are shown in green. So let's begin with those. So we know that the entire purpose of the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway is to produce this complex, the dimer protein complex we call prothrombinase. And that's because it's prothrombinase that ultimately activates prothrombin into thrombin. And it's thrombin that essentially activates fibrinogen to form fibrin. And that's the protein fiber that aggregates to form those blood clots. So the entire point of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway is to form these two components to basically form this dimer that consists of the two subunits factor 10 and factor 5 we call prothrombinase. So notice that when we actually form thrombin, thrombin not only activates fibrinogen into fibrin and calls upon platelets and aggregates factor 13 that is needed to form the covalent bonds between the fibrin molecules, but thrombin actually goes back to the beginning of this entire pathway and activates three different types of factors. It activates factor 11, it activates factor 8, and it activates factor 5. And this process amplifies, it produces the uh, even more of these dimer complexes that are needed to produce these blood clots. So thrombin goes on to factor 11, it takes the inactive form and it activates it. And what factor 11 does is it goes to activate factor 9 and that ultimately creates more of these dimers as shown in this diagram. Now, 
thrombin also activates factor VIII. And factor VIII essentially circulates in our blood and it attaches to this VWF factor, which basically stands for von Willebrand factor. And the von Willebrand factor is a protein that attaches to factor VIII and stabilizes its structure and then attaches to factor IX. And this complex essentially goes on and activates the formation of prothrombinase. So thrombin activates this complex, it activates factor 11, and it also directly activates factor 5. It causes it to bind onto factor 10, and so once again forming prothrombinase. And all these three positive feedback loops essentially carry out the same exact function to form more of these prothrombinase molecules, which eventually form more of thrombin, and that ultimately forms more blood clots that are needed to actually seal off that rupture that took place inside our blood vessel. So these are the three positive feedback loops that you have to be familiar with during the process of blood clotting. Now, on top of these positive feedback loops, we also have other pathways that essentially also amplify amplify and magnify the number of blood clots that we actually form. So notice in this blood clot cascade, we don't directly go from this factor to this. Well, we do go from this to this because the formation of this dimer, the TF7 dimer, directly affects the formation of prothrombinase. But we also have these other pathways. And what these all other pathways do is, once again, they form more of these prothrombinases. And these ultimately form more of our blood clots. So if we look at factor 11, factor 11, which is activated by factor 12, goes on to activate 9, which ultimately forms more of these dimer protein complexes. So Factor 11 is used to amplify the amount of factor 9 formed, which ultimately forms more active factor 10 proteins, and that forms more of these complexes, leading to this final pathway that creates more blood clots. And if we also look at the TF7 complex, we have this direct mechanism by which, direct pathway by which we form more of these dimers, but also this T, uh, TF7 complex creates more of these active factor 9 and these active factor 9 basically also amplify the amount of these dimers formed. So we have a very complex and very extensive pathway, different pathways involved and the ultimate goal of all of these pathways is to create all these different uh, routes by which we can form as many blood clots as possible. So one good analogy is if you're trying to fill a bathtub with water, instead of using one faucet, you could use two faucets to speed up the process. Better yet, if you somehow have access to three faucets, four faucets, it would create a much quicker process. And this is exactly what is done with the blood clotting cascade. Imagine having thousands of different faucets that are used to fill that same bathtub, we're going to carry out the process at a much quicker rate than if we had a single direct pathway to that fibrin that forms the blood clots. Instead of having that one faucet, we have many of the, these different faucets that all carry out the same function to ultimately produce as much blood clots as possible to basically seal off that rupture and prevent the individual from going into shock.